Thank you, and I'd like to now uh, bring Rafael Palayo to the stage. Rafael is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's in the Division of Sleep Medicine. Uh, he's a pediatrician with expertise in sleep and pediatric neurology. He's going to talk with us about sleep. Thank you so much. Um, this morning, one of the first speakers said that um, one of, uh, the, the worst things you could do is change your slides the night before the talk. <laughs> right? Remember that? So I started changing my slides after the lunch break. And the only thing dumber than that was I hadn't realized that I already submitted my slides this morning on a thumb drive to the people over there. So I made changes that were a waste of time. But that was what I was doing. I was thinking about that. Thank you for inviting me here today. We're going to talk about sleep, and I'm a sleep doctor. I've been doing it for a long time. I, I really enjoy it. I got to host three tables, um, three of the breakout sessions. So if I met some of you, I've talked to some of you. We did uh, two of the lunches, one of the breakfasts, and this comes up all the time. At every, every at all the them, um, they were asking the similar questions, and I have to ask you: If you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? Right? If you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? And there's always was this implication that. Is sleep a waste of time? What's the point of doing this? How can we hack sleep? So I ask all of you guys, if you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? What's the point of doing this? One of the earliest sleep scientists said, if sleep has no functions, the biggest mistake evolution ever made. So it has to have functions, and people ask, well, why do we have to do this? Can we get away with it? It seems very inefficient. My patients reflect this community. Uh, I work in Silicon Valley, and every day I'm sure there are meetings in town about how to raise money, how to come up with different ideas. I bet you none of you have ever been in a meeting where somebody says, I've got a good idea, let me pitch you this idea, I want to make a robot that sleeps. Nobody wants that. No, right? That's just a ridiculous thing to you, a sleeping robot. Why would you ever do that? It's about getting rid of sleep. If, on the other hand, anybody presented to you an idea that said, I can get you the feeling, the restorative effects of eight hours of sleep and only four, what would, uh, what would uh, be that worth to you? How much money would you be willing to invest? And would you keep it secret and let other people know about it? So there's this whole thing about getting rid of sleep instead of thinking about what's the value of sleeping. These are sleep disorders that we deal with. I'm a clinician. I take care of lots of patients. All of these things we take care of on a regular basis. We actually have good treatments for all of them. We need help making these treatments even better yet. But the good news, my, I train as a child neurologist, is that the vast majority of the patients that I see are gonna get better. It's actually unusual to see a patient not improve once they address their sleep problems. So it's actually a fun job. I really enjoy doing it. Patients will get better. Definitely there's room for improvement in all these conditions. But the good news to share with people is if you have trouble sleeping, come on in. We should be able to help you improve your sleep. There's no doubt about that. Now, when we talk about sleep, we often break it down to these sleep stages. And a lot of people ask questions about the EEG and the brain waves. And a couple of things I wanna point out to you this is the typical diagram that we talk about sleep. People with sleep problems are trying to chop in common misconceptions about sleep. And I didn't want to give you guys a can't talk. I don't think you guys deserve that. I want to, I want to come up with, it, with some new stuff to explain to you guys. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But some basic stuff. First off, nobody in this room has ever slept eight hours in a row. You never have and you never will. Humans don't sleep eight hours in a row. You sleep about an hour and a half. And every hour and a half, you look around, make sure everything's OK, and you go back to sleep. You do it all night long. If you just watch anybody sleep about every hour and a half, people open their eyes, make sure everything's okay, and we go back to sleep. How can we really be eight hours sleeping mammals, right? Um, if we have to take care of babies, there's a, a couple of babies around, right? If you have to feed a baby every two to four hours, how is it possible that you're gonna sleep eight hours? It doesn't make any biological sense. If we really slept eight hours in a row, lions and tigers would have known to pick us out of the caves a long time ago and attack us because we were sleeping. So there's an inherent paradox to sleep. Animals that are sleeping are, can be attacked at any point. I mentioned that my patients reflect Silicon Valley. I see a lot of smart, logical people all the time. And I can assure you, the smarter you are, the more logical you are, the more rational you are in your approach to your sleep, the more you're gonna screw it up. Because sleeping is illogical. So I see all these logical people. I see a ton of engineers. There's a lot of engineers in town that, that have uh, insomnia. They keep coming up. They see them all the time. The more logical you are, the more rational you are in your approach to your sleep, the more you're gonna screw it up because the right approach to improve your sleep is counterintuitive. Logic would be for us not to sleep at all, right? So we're doing this for some other reasons. Now, a couple of things about sleep that are different, not only do we wake up about every hour and a half, but the cycles are a little bit different from each other as the night goes on. So the bulk of our dreaming sleep occurs in the last third of the night. 
The bulk of our dreams occur in the last third of the night. And this is important because we talk all the time. I've heard it several times here. Follow your dreams. Check out your dreams. When you're waking up early, you're cutting off your dreams. We see this all the time. Why don't you follow your dreams? And what's often overlooked when we talk about sleep stages, people also at the, all the tables, if they ask about slow way sleep, deep sleep, for, you know, what, what's more important, which stage is more important. People never ask about stage one, the lightest form of sleep that we have. When you're in stage one sleep, you actually think you're awake. It's, a, it's, the most li- it's how we enter sleep. And whenever we have these sleep cycles, whenever we wake up, we go back to this really light sleep. And, and you've all seen stage one many times. Go to any boring lecture, the speaker's joining on and on. You're going to see somebody's head drop, right? If you nudge that person, what's the first thing they always say? I'm awake. I'm resting my eyes. They say that every time. And we get into, this, but you know they're sleeping, right? You know they're sleeping. So stage one is the least refreshing, lightest form of sleep that we get, and that's how we start the night. And all these, when we go through these different cycles, we go into more stage one. And if your sleep is inefficient, we talk about sleep efficiency, what percent of the time are you sleeping that you're in bed? We want to be very efficient in our sleep. Now, we've talked a lot about technology here, and I was thinking a little bit about technology that goes on, and I was thinking about alarm clocks. All everybody, you know, you, you cannot sell an alarm clock, you can't buy an alarm clock, it doesn't have a, a snooze button. So we have that technological feature in it, but what's the value of it? It's a ridiculous thing. I'm not a business guy, a lot of finance people here. I don't know much about finance, but I can spot a bad deal. And what and snooze button is a bad deal because what you're doing is you're saying, I'm gonna interrupt my dreaming sleep at a certain time with the alarm clock, but now with the snooze button, I'm, gonna, I'm waking myself in advance to know that I'm gonna interrupt my dreaming, and I'm gonna replace it with what? Stage one sleep. You are substituting stage one um, sleep for REM sleep. That's a bad deal. And that's what the snooze button is doing. Never, just don't use it. But there's a technological feature all these alarm clocks will have. Any sleep problem has four components to it. So people all the time ask me about the amount of sleep, like they stop there. And the amount of sleep is important. But what really matters is how refreshed you are. Is your sleep restorative? So the quality of sleep, is it coming up? Quality of sleep matters more. The third component to any sleep problem when we discuss sleep with our patients is the timing of sleep. And the fourth, probably the most important one of all, is your state of mind. Are you looking forward to waking up? What does sleeping mean to you? Do you look forward to your day or do you dread your day? Right? I have a lot of, we see a lot of uh, successful business people and they say, oh, I'm fine, I'm here because my cardiologist sent me, my, my wife claims I snore. By the way, I've never had a wife be wrong. When the wife says, my, my wife claims I snore, it happens all the time. They say, I'm fine, she just needs earplugs. I hear that almost every day at work. <laughs> the state of mind is the real issue here, right? You look forward to your day. So really patients with, um, they can have really significant sleep apnea, but they're so driven by what they do, they power through it and say, I'm fine, nothing's wrong. I have other patients with really mild sleep apnea, mild problems with their breathing, but they want to go on disability because they don't really enjoy what they're doing. So you always think about what's waking you up and what's your motivation to go to bed when you factor this in. So your state of mind trumps everything here. Um, so there's the symbol for sleep medicine is this yin and yang thing. Sleep medicine, by the way, historically began at Stanford University. And I'm a child neurologist, uh, taking care of mostly adults in the department of psychiatry, and I like it that way. I don't want that to change. Um, it's not fashionable for us to talk about brain, mind. It, became an, it was always that way. In sleep medicine, we never were able to distinguish the brain from the mind. It always was together. Freud described uh, uh, the interpretation of dreams in 1899. We've been using EEG. It always, always came together. We don't separate the mind from the brain at all in sleep, which is fun. So to explain this, I started saying this all the time in class when I'm teaching my students. Your life is a reflection of your sleep, and your sleep is a reflection of your life. And I've said it so many times that some students actually picked up on it, and now they put it on some internet blogs. And now if you look up uh, sleep sayings, this thing that I came up with, just to, this platitude, is up there with the Dalai Lama, Benjamin Franklin on websites. It's actually kind of weird. That's what the Stanford students have done this. You can look it up. It shows up. The other thing I want to tell you guys, sleeping should be silent. Nobody should ever snore. And in children, you should not hear them breathe. Breathing should be silent. Sleeping should be silent. We shouldn't make, if sleeping is inherently dangerous to us, if sleeping is inherently dangerous to us, it makes no sense to make noise and um, um, alert the predators that you're around. Right now, everybody is breathing. I don't hear any snoring, right? Sleeping should be silent. Never accept this. And this is important because it has to do with, with current events. 
you've been talking in the news about the Supreme Court hearings. Well, well part we're having these issues, and part is because Anthony Scalia passed away. And if you read the reports of his death, he, had a, he, had, uh, he died in his sleep, and his CPAP machine was unplugged at his bedside. This is something you can read about. This has actually been published in talking about that is when are we going to stop talking about natural causes? If you have a sedentary lifestyle, many of us have sedentary lifestyles, our peak heart rates is when we're dreaming. The biggest workout your heart gets for many of us is when we're dreaming. Your heart accelerates. Think about this. Sleep research became sleep medicine because we had to be able to explain why people die in their sleep. What's so hard about sleeping that you would die? You know, we think it's related to, to our heart rates and the, the, these issues of this instability that occur. There's a lot of demand that occurs when we're dreaming. You burn up more calories in your brain dreaming than you do when you're awake in some parts of your brain. For me to see you, I have to, re you're, you're reflecting light in my eyes. But for you to have a dream about what's happening around you, you have to create that. It requires more energy. So that's a little bit of how current events and how this ties into sleep. But I want to talk to you about a little bit even more current for me, more important for us right now. There should be no doubt in your minds that teenagers are sleep deprived. Almost all teenagers are sleep deprived. The Center for Disease Control estimates that about 75% of teenagers don't get enough sleep. 75% of teenagers don't get enough sleep. One of the ways you know the beginning of any kind of sleep problem in any one of us, especially in the teenagers, is when they start sleeping in. Parents of little kids, toddlers, elementary school kids don't sleep in on weekends. You wish they would, but they don't, right? When do kids start sleeping in? This whole idea is catching up on their sleep. Teenagers are sleep deprived. And we would never do this if it was related to food. If we were to tell you that 75% of teenagers in the United States aren't getting enough food, you say, well, that's kind of an issue. What's, what's happening there? Or if we tell, as parents, we tell our kids, listen, Monday through Friday, I'm gonna starve you. Saturday and Sunday, eat all you like. We're starting again on Monday to starve you again. And this is how we're dealing with these kids. This has been happening for some time. Why is this important? Because it has real life implications. Teenagers are not getting enough sleep and their mental health and their physical health is being affected. We know there should be no doubt, and you guys can look up the literature, we don't have a ton of time, but there's a body of literature supporting the fact that lack of sleep in adolescence is associated with suicidal thinking and suicidal ideation. You guys in Palo Alto, and I mean, many of you are of Kibbutz from out of town. If you listen to you guys talk, I, I've heard a lot of the lingo that I hear from my patients, and you're talking about ecosystems, and you talk about um, I'm in this space or that space. A lingo that I've learned from being here is people talk about contagions and suicides, and people who do suicide prevention talk to you about contagions. And what that means is when a teenager commits suicide, they want to keep it quiet because they don't want other kids to know about it because they think that that will make them more likely to commit suicide. But around here, there, there's been problems with suicide, and it's happening throughout the country. It's one of the major causes of death. There should be no doubt in your minds that lack of sleep, suicidal thinking, suicidal behavior, and that's just one study in uh, South Korea. United States, the same thing. They found the same thing. And over and over again, there's a whole body of literature about mood and sleep and how they tie into each other and suicidal thinking. And it's not just depression. You can be suicidal and not be depressed. There's so much data supporting the issue of lack of sleep in teenagers that in 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a position paper. And specifically, they realized that if people, if you give teenagers a chance to go to bed, um, the teenagers are gonna be going to bed later. If we let them start school later, they'll do better. This is a very simple idea. And actually it was a face plan. Um, people in the sleep field for a long time knew that teenagers weren't getting enough sleep and it had mental health and other aspects to them. But it was a school superintendent in Minnesota that said, how about we just have school start later? And when they did this, the kids did better. And I remember over 20 years ago, when the first reports came out of Minnesota that this was happening, I was like, nah, that can't be true. They're just gonna stay up later. And people say, well, you, school starts later, kids are gonna stay up later. It's like saying somebody's hungry, I'm not gonna feed them because they're just not gonna eat the food. It turns out not to be the case. The data was that if the kids stayed up, if the school started an hour later, kids got an extra 40 minutes of sleep per night. So yeah, they stayed up a little bit later, but they got their sleep. More importantly, the kids started doing better academically. And then more papers came out. And there was such a body of literature that came around that eventually 
you couldn't hide it anymore. So in 2014, as I mentioned, the Academy of Pediatrics said there's enough evidence-based peer-reviewed uh, uh, literature supporting delaying school start times as one of the most effective countermeasure for sleep loss. Came out, and then after they, they came out, then the American Medical Association put out a paper, the Center for Disease Control, NIH. Um, you name the health organization, the Academy of P uh, Family Practice, child psychiatry organizations, they all started coming out with position papers saying we gotta change school start times. They looked at the data, they analyzed it, and did, said the, the evidence is solid. And just for historical purposes, so you understand this, um, schools in California used to start at 9 o'clock in the morning in the 60s. Schools in California used to start at 9 o'clock in the morning, and what happened was, to save money, they said, we're going to stretch out the bus schedule, and since the younger kids need the parents' help, the older kids are going to go to school earlier to, to save money on the bus schedule. And uh, Dr. Dan Feldman, who's here, said, we literally threw the teenagers under the school bus, is what happened because now the kids are being sleep deprived and nobody expected this, they didn't do it on purpose, but this is what occurred. When we go through adolescence, there's a biological shift in what we're doing. We tend to stay up later. It's not just humans, um, other mammals do the same thing. Rodents do the same thing. When they go through puberty, they stay up later. Somebody has to watch the fire at night. We talked about aging and longevity. We know that people, as they get older, they tend to go to sleep earlier. I think all of you who are over age 50, you notice know easier for you, it's harder for you to stay up later now. The older you get, the harder it is to stay up. But when you're younger, you have a biological tendency to do this. It made sense. A tribe of people, somebody's got to watch the fire. The point being that teenagers not only need more sleep, it's harder for them to go to bed earlier. So the 8.30 start time made sense. So this was studied. The RAND Corporation reviewed this. And they said delaying school start time is a cost-effective measure. In fact, it me the savings are in billions of dollars. This pays for itself. California alone would save over a billion dollars if we delay the school start times. This is another study they've looked at this. Graduation rates go up, and the lower socioeconomic uh, uh, schools have the, higher, the highest gains. Delaying school start times, you improve graduation rates. High performing schools, it's hard to get them to improve. So in California, those of you who are out of state may not know this, but a bill was put in place to delay school start times throughout the entire state, SB 328. I got to testify in, uh, in Sacramento twice for this bill. And it proposes simply that uh, in, over the next three years, all public high schools and middle schools start at 8.30 or later. It's being opposed by the teachers union and it's being opposed by the uh, superintendents because they believe that it's up to their local control. And it's a little bit like adolescents, they go, if you go to these meetings, they say things like, we believe in the science, but we don't think Sacramento should tell us what to do. And this happens a lot. So they're telling us, you know, we don't think that you should, we should be told what to do. Um, Dr. Roberts started the conference yesterday, and you said that we're here to make a change. And I want to tell you guys, we can make a change right now. Because the bill, after having uh, not passed last year, passed this year, just passed uh, at the end of August. Last day of the, uh, the assembly session, the bill passed. So the bill now sits on the governor's desk. He could veto it any day, but he has to pass it or sign it by the end of the month. So you guys can actually right now, without spending a penny, you just contact the governor. Some of you probably know the governor. Some of you may have connections with the governor, okay? Any of you, please urge the governor to sign the bill because what it's really gonna be saying is that we're gonna value science over special interest groups. And with that, I wanna end, end the talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, I don't think we, are there any questions? I have questions, but I don't think we have any time. If you want to talk to me more about this bill or what to do, but we got to do it like now. Like we only have a few days to get this done. That's my email. Thank you for listening, guys.